six years, probably. Um, right, let me show you something real quick. I'm going to show you what's already been entered into evidence in States 163. I'm going to have you look at that image, and particularly what's there on that pool table. Do you recognize that? That's a picture of a 300 blackout. All right. And is that, that the one that you and Paul would take hog hunting? Yes, that's one of them. Uh, you said one got stolen. To your knowledge, was there ever a replacement gun? I don't remember a replacement. You yes, don't sir. remember a replacement? You remember Paul using the black one, is that right? That's correct. Or either the green and tan one before it was stolen. Before it was stolen. That's correct. Five or six years ago. Correct. Um, what other guns did Paul use a lot that he favored? He favored a super black Eagle shotgun, 12 gauge. All right. Let me show you another image if I could. I'm going to show you what's already been made into evidence in States 3 and see if you recognize that. I do. All right, tell me what that is. That's a super black eagle. All right, and do you specifically recognize that gun? Yes. And what gun is that? That's Paul's gun. And how can you tell? The camo pattern and the strap. Um, would Paul frequently have weapons with him when he was on the property or in his truck or that sort of thing? He would. What sort of weapons would he have frequently have with him? A lot of times he carried a 300 blackout in his vehicle, and then I mean, sometimes pistols, different shotguns. Okay. But, All right. Would he carry that uh, shotgun a lot as well? Yes, I have seen him carry that shotgun. Show you what's been previously entered in evidence of states four. We do me a favor. See that box of gloves right there? We just put them on the floor behind you, just kind of out of the way. I'm gonna have you look in here and see if you recognize that. That's Super Black Eagle three of Paul's. That's Paul's favorite shotgun. That's correct. Deer. Did he have a weapon he liked uh, hunting deer with? He did. It was a seven millimeter weight. Okay. Um, did Paul ever have any pistols, to your knowledge, or carry around any pistols? He did sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes. Uh, what were his favorite two guns? Or the most guns he most commonly had around? Probably that 300 and uh, Super Black Eagle. That's the ones I've seen him use the most. Tell me about uh, a little bit about the uh, the hog hunt. You said y'all would hunt them at night. That's correct. All right. And tell me how that works. What, what would y'all do? Y'all walking around? Y'all riding around? Riding around? How does that go? The most time we drove four wheeler vehicle. We didn't hardly ever walk, but that scope, the thermal scope, would pick up the heat. Okay. And where on the property would y'all hunt? All over. The hogs you hunt all over. That's correct. Um, when you and Paul were together hunting uh, with that blackout, um, did you usually have the gun and shooting, or did Paul usually have the gun and shooting? It just depends. Well, who had the gun more? Probably Paul. One guy's driving, the other guy's looking? That's correct. Is that something y'all did frequently? A good bit, yes, sir. Uh, if y'all ever killed a hog, what would y'all do with it? Sometimes we would give it to people that wanted to butcher it. Sometimes we just let nature take its course, just leave it wherever it was shot at. It just depends. Sometimes we'd skin them out ourselves. Or uh, hogs and nuisance animals? They are. We're talking a little bit about Paul and who he was. How was Paul on his cell phone? He was on his cell phone a lot. Let 
Let me ask you a little bit about Miss Maggie. Uh, you mentioned before that the family had a couple of properties. Uh, in the summertime, where did Miss Maggie prefer to stay? She liked to stay at Edisto. And did you know why she preferred Edisto? Because of the yellow flies at Moselle. The yellow flies? That's correct. Uh, what about Paul and, and Alec? Where would they stay most of the time? Well, Paul, if he was back home, he'd stay at Moselle. But a lot of times he was in Columbia or Charleston. Did he have an apartment in Charleston? No, not, not to my knowledge in Charleston, no. I'm sorry, in Columbia. I in Columbia, say. yes. Okay, thank you. Um, back in uh, June 7th of 2021, you were working in agriculture? That's correct. Working in farming? That's correct. Hard work? Yes, sir. What time do you have to get up in the morning and go to work? Normally get up about 5 o'clock. 5 o'clock. Where were you staying at that point in time? I was staying at my girlfriend's house in Buford. In Buford. Um, do I have to say her last name? What was her first name? Mary Ann. Mary Ann? Okay. And uh, why were you staying in Buford at that period, at that point in time? Was that where your house was or, or not? No, my house was not there. I, I was working on St. Helena. It made it a closer ride for me to go to work. So you're staying with your girlfriend because of that? That's correct. Did you have a dog at that time? I did. And uh, what kind of dog? Chocolate lamb. Chocolate lamb. Uh, still have the chocolate lamb? I do. What's the dog's name? Cash. Cash. How old was Cash about that time? I'm guessing some, he was a puppy four, six months old maybe. Um, did you, uh, were you able to keep Cash with you when you were staying at your girlfriend's in Buford? I was not able to. And why was that? Because she wasn't allowed. She was renting a house. We couldn't keep one there. What uh, arrangements did you make for cash when you were staying in Buford and you couldn't keep him at your girlfriend's house? I would leave him at the kennels at Moselle. And tell me how that came to be. How did you work that out? I asked Mr. Ellick if I could leave him there. And I'd be gone at a week at a time. Right. Just leave him there for a week, pick him back up when I come back home on the weekend. All right, really interesting. This witness, a friend of Paul's, said, hey, yeah, there was a gun that was stolen out of Paul's truck. What happened to that missing gun? Stay tuned. We're going to bring you back to this case after a short break in South Carolina. Life of Alec Murdoch is bizarre. It is complicated. This great South Carolina attorney is charged with the murders of his own wife and son. Okay, and are they breathing? No, ma'am. Who exactly is this guy? The evidence is going to show that he was there. He is innocent. Who knows where this thing is going to end? This case needs to be resolved. We need to put this behind us and move on. Murdoch Family Murders. Live coverage today, only on Court TV. At ethoslife.com. Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Ashley Wilcott. Thank you for joining us. Really big news. Just moments ago, a jury found former stockbroker Mark Jensen guilty of first degree intentional homicide in the anti freeze murder retrial. Jensen was accused of poisoning his wife, Julie, with anti freeze back in 1998. His defense team argued that Julie was depressed over a failing marriage and that she took her own life to frame her husband. A sentencing date for Jensen has been set for April 14th. Now we want to go back to Colleton County, South Carolina, where all day long we have been watching day five of testimony in the Murdoch family murders trial. 54-year-old disgraced attorney Alec Murdoch is accused of murdering his wife and son back in June of 2019. Prosecutors say he did it to buy time to cover up the theft of millions of dollars from his law firm and his client which he feared was about to be discovered. Murdoch claims he was at his mother's home at the time of the murders. Still on the witness stand right now, Paul Murdoch's childhood friend, Rogan Gibson. Let's get you back into court. June 7th, 2021, did you have any communications with Paul? I did. What's Some, the first one you remember? Sometime around lunchtime. All right. What did y'all communicate? Did y'all talk on the phone? Did y'all text or what? Yeah, I think he called me and told me about the Sunflowers had been sprayed in the dough field and they were dead. Okay. What did he say about that? Said that he was getting ready to replant them. Okay. They'd been sprayed with some Roundup or something? That's correct. Did y'all talk about anything else that you remember? Not that I remember.
While I'm thinking about it, um, I asked you about Paul and his use of a cell phone. Do you know where he kept his cell phone when it wasn't in his hand? Most of the time in his pockets. Um, was he typically one to respond pretty quick to you? If normally, you were talking about something? Normally, yeah, if we were talking about something, he would respond pretty quick. That evening, well, I took, did, you Paul, did you talk to Paul again after that initial conversation? I did. All right. And when was that, roughly? Around 8, 840. Okay. And what, uh, what was that conversation about? He called and said, asked if something was wrong with the dog's tail. Okay. And was that the first you were hearing about that? That's correct. Tell me about your conversation. I told him that, you know, I wasn't real sure. I just dropped him off there Sunday and um, told him, let's try to see if he can get me a picture or FaceTime me and let me see what was going on with the dog's tail. All right. Where was Paul when he called you? He was at the dog kennels. And how do you know that? I could hear the dogs barking in the original call. Is he describing to you what he's seeing on Cash's tail? That's correct. And Cash was at the kennels? He was. Did you hear any other voices when you were on the phone with Paul about 840? I did. And what voices did you hear? I heard Miss Maggie. And who else did you hear? And I thought it was Mr. Ellick that I heard. You thought it was Mr. Ellick? You talked to Paul, and, and what did y'all talk about? What was he going to do? He was going to try to FaceTime me. And he said, you know how the service is out here. He said, if I can't get the FaceTime to go through, I'll send you a video. And why was he going to FaceTime me? What's the difference between FaceTime and a regular call? So I could see what the dog, what was wrong with the dog. And y'all talked about how the service is out here? That's correct. And what did you mean by that? Most of the time you got enough service to make a call. I mean, sometimes calls will break up, but a FaceTime couldn't really get a whole lot of service to make the FaceTime call. It's kind of lagging. Y'all had problems with that before? That's correct. Did y'all discuss what to do if the FaceTime didn't work? We did. And what was the discussion? He was going to send me a video of it, of the dog. He was going to video it and then do what with it? Text it to you? That's correct. Is that the last time you ever talked to your friend? That was. Did y'all try to FaceTime? We did. Did it work? It, it came through, but it was kind of lagging. I couldn't tell what was going on. And then never heard from him again? That's correct. Did you ever get that video? I did not. After you never got the video, did you try to reach back out to Paul to see if you could get him to respond? I did. I called him a few times and texted him. Did he ever respond? He didn't. Did you reach out to anyone else trying to get Paul to respond? I texted Miss Maggie. Did she respond? She didn't. About what time do you think you went to bed that night? I'm not exactly sure. It was sometime right after I probably tried to contact him. And you never heard from Miss Maggie either? I did. Did you ever talk to her at all that day? I didn't. What time, about what time do you think you went to bed? I'm going to say somewhere around 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock. You a pretty sound sleeper? That's correct. You been working on the farm all day? That's correct. Did some calls come in that you didn't realize because you were asleep? Yes, I woke up with some missed calls. What time did you wake up the next morning? Sometime around 5, 5.30. When did you find out that your friend Paul and his mother Maggie had been murdered? That same time, 5, 5.30. How would you find out? I called one of my friends that had left me, a, or I had a missed call from, and yeah. he told me what had happened. Right. And had, tell me his first name, please. Nolan. Yeah. What would you do after that? We got a little boy up and got him to school without talking about it a whole lot, and then we headed back home. And by home, you mean Collison County? Collison County, that's correct. And where'd you go from there? I went to my house first. Then I ended up going to Moselle. About what time you think you got there? Sometime maybe 8, 30, 9 o'clock. Um, what'd you see when you got there? Where'd you go on the property? I went to the dog kennels. And who'd you see there? Did you talk to anyone there? I did, and I seen John Marvin. 
but I didn't speak to him. Um, did you talk to anybody at the scene when you first went there? The only person I seen was John Marvin. What'd you do after that? Uh, my cousin let the dog out to kennel. That being cash? That's correct. Did you take cash with you? I did. And where'd y'all go from there? Uh, the, to the convenience store. Okay. Down and the road from the house. And who'd you meet there? I met a game warden. Okay. And what'd you do after that? What, did you have a conversation? I did. I have, had a conversation with him, and he said that law enforcement was going to be wanting to speak with me. And I told him, I said, well, if you got a contact, let's get him up here and let's talk. And so did you wait for uh, law enforcement to arrive? I did. Do you remember who you talked to? I did. And who'd you talk to? Uh, Jeff Croft and Katie McAllister. And uh, did they do an interview of you? They did. Did they ask you about your communications with Paul the night before? They did. And did they ask you uh, to see your cell phone? They did. Did they take screenshots of your cell phone? That's correct. Were you showing them your communications the night before with Paul and Maggie and others the night before? Yes, sir. Were you holding up the phone and they were taking screenshots? Yes, sir. And now we have an identification of that third voice on the video. This witness said, I heard a voice, I heard Maggie, and a voice I thought was Mr. Alec. Stay tuned, we're gonna get you back into this courtroom for more compelling testimony. Tonight on Closing Arguments, visiting the scene where Alec Murdoch survived a gunshot wound to his head. Plus, expert insight into today's gripping testimony. We're live from South Carolina as prosecutors continue to build their case. And on the docket, she's made millions selling risque content online. Now, she's accused of murdering her boyfriend. Closing Arguments with Vinny Politan, tonight at 8, 7 Central, only on... ShopGuilt.com today. I'm Jenley Painter in South Carolina for the Murdoch Family Murders Trial. This is Court TV, your front row seat to justice. Back now to South Carolina for more testimony in the Murdoch family murders trial. Prosecutors accuse Alec Murdoch of murdering both his wife and his son at their home and hunting lodge in Colleton County. Back in June of 2021, Alec Murdoch faces 30 years to life if he is convicted. We want to go back into the courtroom now. Paul is, Paul Murdoch's friend rather, is on the stand, Rogan Gibson. That's correct. Are these our outgoing calls? They are. Who are you trying to call? Paul Murdoch. Tell me the times you tried to call him. Start from the bottom, please. 9.10 p.m., 9.29 p.m., 9.42 p.m., 9.57 p.m. Did he ever respond? No, sir. I'll show you Westwood Mark to States 169. Is that another screenshot of your phone? It is. Who are you trying to call right there? Paul. What's that last call? 10.08 p.m. Did he answer that call? He did not. I'll show you what's been marked as states 170. Is that another screenshot of your phone? It is. And who are you trying to uh, text right here? Miss Maggie. What time did you try to text her? 9.34 p.m. And what did you text her? Tell Paul to call me. Tell Paul to call me. Yes, sir. Did she ever respond? She did not. You said you woke up the next morning on June 8th, 2021, and you saw you had some missed calls. Is that right? That's correct. And we'll show you what's been marked as States 171. Was this also a screenshot or a picture that uh, Special Agent Croft took of your phone? It is. And who are those missed calls from? Mr. Ellick. And what time did they come in? 10.21 p.m. and 10.24 p.m. And did you, that would have been on June 7th, 2021? That's correct. Were you asleep at that time? I was. Unaware they were coming in? That's correct. 172, is that another screenshot of your phone? It is. Right. And those other missed calls that came in? 
10.25 p.m. and 10.30 p.m. When you spoke to Special Agent Croft on June 8th, 2021, did you tell him and Special Agent McAllister who you thought you heard on that phone call at 8.40? I did. And who did you say you heard? I thought it was Mr. Ellick, but I wasn't exactly sure. Did you give him a percentage? I did. What'd you say? 99%. That you heard Mr. Ellick on that phone call at 8.40? That's correct. As time went on after the murders, did you go to Moselle where all the family and friends were gathering? I did. Were you there a fair amount? Probably the whole part of that next or that later that week. While you were there at the house where the family and friends had gathered, did anyone ever ask you about your last contact with Paul? There was. And who asked you? Grandma. And that being Miss Brandstutter? That's correct. Maggie's mother? That's correct. And what did you say? I told her, yeah, that I talked to Paul about the dog. I told her that I heard Miss Maggie in the background and I heard a male voice that I thought was Mr. Ellick. Was he in the room then? Yes. Did he stand up and say, no, I wasn't there? He didn't. <clears throat> Did you ever have any conversation with Ellick Murdoch about what happened that night? No, sir. Did he ever ask you about whether or not you heard him on that, that phone that night? No, sir. Did he ever tell you what he did that night? No, sir. Did you ever ask him what he did that night? No, sir. Not a subject you wanted to talk about, was it? That's correct. Over time, as the months passed, following the murder of Paul and Maggie. Did you, you were ultimately interviewed by law enforcement and, and other part of the process and that sort of thing, is that correct? That's correct. And as time went on and you were asked about who you heard on the phone that night, that call at 840, you said, hey, I thought it was Alec, but I can't be sure. That's correct. Told law enforcement the night of, 99% sure, correct? Say that question again, please. Told law enforcement the next day, June 8th, that you were 99% sure, is that correct? That's correct. As time went on, you said, I thought it was Alec, but I can't be sure. That's correct. In November of 2022, did law enforcement ask you to come in and look at a video? They did. And did you watch that video? I did. And what was on that video? It was the video. Paul was supposed to take a cash. Cash was on the video. And did you hear, recognize the voices on there? I did. Did you recognize the voices of your second family? I did. And what voices did you hear? Paul's, Miss Maggie, Miss Ellick. And how sure are you now? Positive. 100%? That's correct. All right, they're taking a stretch break, and I have to bring in my two experts, criminal defense attorneys, Josh Schiffer and Jack Rice, former prosecutor. Listen, do you cross him? Because he said a couple of different things. It could be Mr. Alec. It's 99% Mr. Alec. And then today, he's 100% sure. Do you cross? So the defense has to cross. The question is, if they don't ask questions, the jury's going to turn and go, why didn't he ask him about that? <laughs> Ooh, what do you think? Well, you know what? You know, the, 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 I know I'm hyperventilating. <laughs> this is the question where you always ask, do you ever ask a question you don't, you don't know the answer to? You have no choice. They are backed into a corner with this. They have to be able to counter this issue because this is the linchpin of this case. This is the point where they can put Alec Murdoch at the crime scene, and you have to be able to say, you called this space, Paul was there, and you knew he was there, you knew his mom was there because she lives there. You know who else lived there? Who? Who was that? It was Alec, right? And so you assumed it was Alec. 
Right? And because Something, he did go anything. from could be to 99% to 100%. Oh, I mean, I was dude. not expecting that answer. No. Oh, oh, my. They locked him in. Everybody Ooh. saw. You can tell the body language. He doesn't want to be there. This has been massaged and workshopped yes. forever. And this is, fair to say, the bet the farm moment because what this really is is the alibi. And, and this directly confronts yeah. the alibi. Yep. And All right, we're going to have to take a break. Beautiful prosecution. Oh, yeah, really absolutely. Oh, prosecutor did a great job. Prosecution. And this is how he was looking on the stand why we say he didn't want to be testifying all right coming up next we're going to take you back to south carolina for more of this testimony in the alec murdoch murder trial this is court tv your front row seat to justice Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Ashley Wilcott. Appreciate you all being with us today. Court TV is live in South Carolina for the Alec Murdoch murder trial. And what a day it has been in court today. Murdoch is accused of killing his wife and son. Evidence revealed in court today could be the most important piece of evidence yet for that prosecution. It is the Snapchat video found on the phone of Murdoch's son, Paul. I've been on the edge of my seat watching today. The state claims that this is the evidence that places Murdoch at the crime scene only minutes before the murders. The prosecution witness says three voices are heard on the video, which I would agree with. Take a listen. Get back, get back. Quick, Cash. Come on. Quick. Come on. Come on, Dad. Come on, Cash. Come on. Post it. Get it. Hey, he's got a bird in his mouth. Bubba. Hey, Bubba. It's a guinea. This is a chicken. Come here, Bob. Boy, you have got to let us know what you think you heard on that video. Of course, we're going to get you back into court in just a moment. But first, we want to report on a verdict in Wisconsin. The jury found Mark Jensen guilty of first-degree intentional homicide in the death of his wife, Julie. He returns to court on April 14th for sentencing. The prosecutor spoke to our own Julia Janae after the verdict. We will have that later here on Court TV. Now, let's go back to court. I mean, I have not been able to turn my head away from this case in South Carolina for the Alec Murdoch double murder trial. On the stand now is Paul Murdoch's friend, Rogan Gibson. And the state is playing again that video from Paul's phone. Let's get you back into court. It is. Where is that video taken? At the kennels. You recognize your dog? I do. You recognize Paul's voice? Yes, sir. You recognize Maggie's voice? Yes, sir. You recognize Alex's voice? Yes, sir. 100%? Yes, sir. Can you point out Alec Murdoch, the person whose voice you recognize in this video in this courtroom, please? Sitting right there in the gray jacket. 
Please let the record reflect he's identified the defendant. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Gibson. <coughs> Nothing further. Times, haven't we? Yes, sir. Um, tell the jury more about Paul, please. What What did y'all like to do together? We loved hunting, fishing, just hanging around. We loved staying at the beach, going to the sandbar. He was he could get along with just about anybody. See one of your best friends? He is. Is this a hard day for you? Yes, sir. And did you live um, one summer in, in the cabin there on the property? Yes, me, Buster, and Nolan lived in the cabin. And Paul was there a lot. Right. And and when you got a house of your own, I think I mean it was just right down the road, wasn't it? Yes, sir. Down Moselle Road. Yes, sir. It was your grandparents' house or you moved into? That's correct. And um, but before that, Ms. Maggie and Big Red over here, Mr. Alec, I mean, they treated you as family, didn't they? That's correct. They did. And Paul was like a brother to you? Yes, sir. And Ms. Maggie was like a second mom to you? Yes, sir. And Mr. Allen was like a second dad? Yes, sir, he was. And could you tell the jury how, what you observed Alec's relationship was starting with you? What was his relationship with you? We had a good relationship. I mean, he treated me like one of his own. I mean, we, we had fun. He, he gave me permission to hunt the property. Do you have permission to come and go and <clears throat> down to the shop? I did. And did you have permission to use any of the equipment? Yes, sir. And did you help out on, on the on the farm for game management and stuff? I did. Okay. And um, and can you tell the jury a little bit about Mr. Allen's relationship with his son Paul? Very good relationship. Were Very they, good. Were they close? They were. Nothing happened without Paul telling Mr. Ellick about it. And did, um, jury's heard some, Alec interviewed on the tape, uh, various about how the Moselle property was Paul's passion. It was. Do you agree with that? Yes, sir. Um, why do you think it was his passion? What, why, what was he so passionate about out there? He, he just loved hunting and with um, using the equipment to manage for a wild game, fishing. Right. He loved all of that. Was Paul a good friend? Yes, sir. Was he a loyal friend? He was. Was he a loyal son? Yes, sir. Tell me about Miss Maggie. She was like a second mother to me. I always took care of me, treated me like one of hers. Did um, you spend time with down at Edisto? I did. Um, and um, you and Paul and Ms. Maggie sometimes, just the three of you there, down there? It was. Okay. Um, what, what did Ms. Maggie like to do? She liked the beach. Um, when they were down at Edisto. Was it, were you the only friend welcome at the Edisto house or, or what was it like? There was many friends that were welcome to the house. Uh, like adult friends or, or was it, was most Ms. Maggie, Mr. Alex home, was it open to all of Paul and Buster's friends? It was open to all of Paul and Buster's friends. And was that the case at Edisto? That's correct. Was that the case at Moselle? It was. Um, 
Did, did it appear to you that Mr. Alec enjoyed being around his family? Yes, sir, he did. And did you enjoy being around Mr. Alec and Ms. Maggie? Yes, sir. You remember and I apologize I'm gonna get the date wrong, but um, do you remember in early twenty nineteen that Paul's in a boating accident? Yes, sir. Um, and a beautiful young woman died in that accident, didn't they? Yes, sir. Her name was Mallory Beach. That's correct. And um, and Paul was eventually charged. Is that correct? <laughs> Yes, sir. Did, um, did Paul receive any threats or harassments that you knew about as a result of that boating action? None that I thought was real serious. I mean, he mentioned it that, you know, he'd get people comment about it, but nothing that I thought was real serious. Did, um, did he, um, would people just mouth off to him when he went out to bars or? Just with his friends? Yes, sir. He had mentioned that. But it, was it anything that, that you thought was serious? All right, his friend says that Paul did receive some threats. Let me, before we have to go to a break, let me hear from each of you. Kind of your final thoughts, Jack, first, as to where we are in this trial right now. This is incredibly dangerous for the defense, but they have to come in and they have to show what it is that this man does know. He can show motive from other people who hated Paul because of that accident. That's a piece of this. They're also showing him actually turning against the family, considering the family really helped raise him. So they're trying to get the jury to not like him. They're still stepping up slowly to that conversation at the kennel. They're not there yet, but that's got to be coming. That's what we're waiting for, holding our breath on. All right, and look, Alec's face, uh, Alec Murdoch's face has been turning red throughout this. I'm just pointing that out, live court picture. Josh? Uh, yeah, the state has certainly taken an upper hand today. This was the strongest performance. That was a masterful job uh, by Creighton Waters. Um, the defense has got to mitigate this young man's testimony. Otherwise, it's a sinking ship. It's over. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see what all they bring out on this cross. We, I mean, some of the most compelling testimony we've seen throughout the course of this trial. We're going to squeeze in a break so we can get you right back in for continuing testimony in the case against Alec Murdoch. On closing arguments, visiting the scene where Alec Murdoch survived a gunshot wound to his head. Plus, expert insight into today's gripping testimony. We're live from South Carolina as prosecutors continue to build their case. And on the docket, she's made millions selling risque content online. Now, she's accused of murdering her boyfriend. Closing arguments with Vinnie Politan tonight at 8, 7 Central, only on Court TV. Let's go back to South Carolina for more testimony in the Murdoch family murders trial. The prosecutors, of course, accusing Alec Murdoch of murdering his wife and son at their home and hunting lodge in Colleton County back in June of 2021. He faces 30 years to life if convicted. We want to get you back into the courtroom still on the stand is a friend of Paul Murdoch, Rogan Gibson. He testified this was like a second family to him. He's been describing what it's like to live in rural South Carolina, the hunting that they do the duck ponds they have to drain. Let's go back to court. Got it. So I don't know. A guinea. Guinea. And then, then you heard a voice say, no, it's a chicken. Do you remember whose voice that was? That was Mr. Alex that said it the first time, and then Paul also said it was a chicken. Okay. And then, um, and then someone says, Bubba, let go of that chicken or something like that? Yeah, just, just holler for Bubba. And, and whose voice do you recognize hollering for Bubba? Mr. Ellen. Okay. And who's Bubba? Their dog. Do they have, uh, and, and was B Bubba a yellow lab? He was. Did Bubba have his own kennel? He did. Which one was it? Most of the time he was in the first one right beside the feed room. Now, you had talked to 
Paul, I think the records show you had a four minute telephone conversation before that, that video was taken, which you didn't receive until law enforcement showed you. But you remember, you talked to Paul for about four minutes, right? That's correct. And, and I believe when, when you were interviewed, um, you said it sounded like Mr. Alec had, had pulled up or something to that effect, driven up. Do you remember that? No, I don't ever remember hearing a vehicle. Okay. I just remember hearing a, a third voice. Okay. And the, and the next day, excuse me, was, was it, was it the 8th, the next day you went over um, and met with, and went into the house at, at Moselle and you saw Maggie's parents? That's correct. And, and that's when Grandma, Ms. Brandstetter, asked you uh, if you heard Maggie's voice? Yes. Okay. And you told her you did? Told her I heard, I talked to Paul and heard Miss Maggie. And, and you told, told him in front of everybody that you had um, thought you'd heard, heard Alex's voice too, right? That's correct. And he didn't push back whatsoever? No, sir. What, what was Alex's um, demeanor uh, when you first saw him after the murders and days after? What? He was just real, real distraught, sad. Just tore up about it. Did he cry a lot? Yes, sir. Did he hug you? He did. Did he cry? Yes, sir. Did you cry? Yes, sir. I mean, did he cry the, the day after and the day after? I mean, that was really sad. Right. One second, man. On this um, vi video, uh, you've been around Alec, Maggie, and Paul most all your life. Well, was there any, did you notice any signs of distress or anxiety or anything out of the ordinary? I did not. <clears throat> and, um, and you've been around Maggie and Alec and their whole family a lot? Almost all of my life, yes, sir. And um, would you see Alec openly show his display of affection and love to Maggie? Yes, sir. And from your observation, they have a close, good relationship? That's correct. And they were loving to each other and, and to Paul and Buster and their friends, correct? That's correct. And you can, can you think of any circumstance that you can envision, knowing them as you do, where Alec would brutally murder Paul and Maggie. Not that I can think of. Thank you. That's all the questions I have. Anything further? You were asked some questions about the sheds being unlocked. Paul ever complained to you that people were up there stealing all kinds of stuff all the time? I was never aware of people stealing anything. Um, when you talked to Paul and heard Maggie and Alec at 840, was there any problem with that voice call or did it come through just fine? The reception was good. The call came through, yes. And the last conversation you had with Paul was he was going to do what if the FaceTime didn't work? Send me a video. And he never did. That's correct. You've heard that video and you hear three voices, is that correct? Maggie, Paul, and Mr. Alec? In the video, yes, sir. When you're uh, standing, if you're at the house or inside the house on the second floor or something like that, can you see the roofs of the sheds and down there? 
the last time I had been out there, yes, you would be able to see the top of the structure. And if you're standing out here in front of them sheds, could you see the top of the house the other way? Same thing, yeah. Last time I was there, you would be able to see the top of the structure. There was trees growing between the houses. And that was a long time ago, right? That's correct. Down there at the sheds, uh, did they have like outdoor lighting down there? Yes, sir, they did. And if all that was on, could you see all that lighting from the house? Yes, you would be able to see that there were lights on from the house. If those lights were on, it'd be pretty well lit up, is that right? If all of them were, yes. You're asked about uh, the boat wreck. Um, were you aware that Paul had been charged in that boat wreck? I was. Were you aware that Alec Murdoch had been sued in that boat wreck? I was. What was your perception of Alec's wealth? Did you believe he was a fairly wealthy man? Yes, sir. How long have you known Alec Murdoch? Pretty much all my life. As you sit here today, did you really know him? Yes, I know Mr. Ellett. But as you sit here today, do you really know him? Yes, I know Mr. Ellett. Thank you. Anything further? No, John. You may step down.